This is Randy Shell, and I'm making a podcast entitled Anesthesiology Gaps in Knowledge 2015. This is part of the University of Kentucky Department of Anesthesiology Didactic Program. What are gaps in knowledge? On a previous podcast, uh, there were the anesthesiology gaps in knowledge for 2016 covered. This is for 2015. These are questions in, on the ITE, American Board of Anesthesia Examination, where the majority of residents answered this topic incorrectly. Um, and the ABA publishes the topics in an attempt to encourage those who miss these questions to learn from them. The first gap in knowledge in 2015 was that an increase in butyrylcholinesterase activity in morbidly obese patients contributes to their relative resistance to succinylcholine. Clinically, we increase our dose of succinylcholine to, for example, one and a half per kilo instead of one per kilo in the morbidly obese patient. And one of the reasons for that is their plasma cholinesterase, which is another name for butylcholinesterase. Pseudocholinesterase is another name for the same enzyme. Uh, so butylcholinesterase, plasma cholinesterase, pseudocholinesterase are all referring to the same thing. And they metabolize succinylcholine as well as mivacurium. Pseudocholinesterase can have a quantitative increase, such as discussed here in obesity, but also alcoholism can do that. Quantitative decrease can occur if the liver is just not making this protein, uh, and it also occurs during pregnancy. It can also be qualitatively abnormal, so it's not an amount that's the problem, it's the enzyme and how it works itself. And when you hear the word dibucane, which is a amide local anesthetic uh, number, Dibucane number refers to inhibition of this enzyme by the amide local anesthetic dibucane, which is normally 80%. It inhibits this enzyme 80%. In the homozygous qualitatively abnormal pseudocholinesterase, it's inhibited only 20%, therefore the number dibucane of 20. And when the dibucane number is 40 to 60, this uh, is a heterozygous qualitatively abnormal pseudocholinesterase. Gap number two in 2015 was the metabolites of hydromorphone and what can happen uh, with them. The three glucuronide metabolite of hydromorphone will accumulate in renal insufficiency and may cause neuroexcitation and cognitive impairment. That was the gap in knowledge. On the bottom left is morphine and hydromorphone metabolism and the active metabolites that can accumulate in renal failure. Morphine is metabolized to morphine 6-glucuronide, which is a uh, sugar in the sixth position. It has analgesic properties, and it also can be metabolized to morphine 3-glucuronide. Um, so morphine given repetitively to a patient with renal failure, these metabolites can build up. Hydromorphone also has a 3-glucuronide metabolite, which has no analgesic effects, but is a potent neuroexocytotoxic effect, and it accumulates in the CSF. In the table in the far right, there's some recommendations for opioids and renal failure. Uh, codeine, we shouldn't uh, administer it to patients with renal failure. Um, a paradine, the uh, normal paradine metabolite builds up and can cause seizures. Morphine, we said, had uh, two major metabolites, the 6 and the 3 glucuronide, and tramadol we, is not recommended in patients with renal failure. Fentanyl appears to be safe, as does methadone, um, and hydromorphone, we said, has a 3 glucuronide metabolite. That was the gap in knowledge because that metabolite can cause neuroexcitation and cognitive impairment postoperatively in patients with renal insufficiency. The third gap from the in-training exam in 2015 was that dehydration will increase the strong ion deficit. I think there's a fair amount of confusion about strong ion and what it means and how it relates to uh, um, arterial blood gases and blood gas management. But let's first define the strong ion deficit as the difference between the strong cations, positively charged, and the strong anions, the negatively charged. So strong ion difference is equal to the sodium 
plus potassium, plus calcium, plus magnesium, these are the cations, minus the anions, chloride and lactate, and there's some that are not measured. And the difference between those is approximately 40. Now, you say, well, there's got to be electrical neutrality, and that is true. Uh, but of what we commonly measure, the difference between the positive cations and the anions, the negatively charged ones, is approximately 40. Now, strong ion difference influences pH, and it does so by affecting water dissociation. For example, if you had a sudden increase in an anion, the strong ion difference would get smaller, okay. and what would happen is with all of these negatively charged molecules around, we need to maintain electrical neutrality, so water dissociates to hydrogen ion, which is a, a change in pH of acidosis. This is the classic example of hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis that occurs with large volume saline resuscitation. Lots of chloride. Chloride comes in, reduces the strong ion difference, and causes the dissociation of water to hydrogen ion to maintain electrical neutrality. So there's some things listed here that increase strong ion difference and decrease strong ion difference, and let's go over those next. Dehydration, which was the gap in knowledge, causes a contraction alkalosis. Um, we frequently see contraction alkalosis in patients on diuretics like furosemide. And dehydration increases sodium, uh, which is a strong ca cation. And <clears throat> so if you have a buildup of a strong cation, the strong ion difference becomes greater than 40. And so it increases the strong ion difference. Chloride loss that it can occur with an NG suction. If you lose lots of chloride, you can see how that would reduce the strong anion side, and the difference between the positives and the negatives would become greater, and you have an increased strong ion difference. Things that decrease the strong ion difference, as previously mentioned, large volume saline resuscitation. Saline being 0.9 normal saline is what we're discussing, where there's 154 milliequivalents per liter of sodium and 154 milliequivalents per liter of chloride. Well, 154 milliequivalents per liter of chloride is a huge amount of chloride compared to what's normally in our blood. So if you resuscitate with this large volume of chloride, you can see that the strong anions would increase which would decrease the strong ion difference because you have positives minus negatives, which is normally 40. Now you add some negatives, the chloride to it, and this strong ion difference becomes smaller. So there's a decrease in strong ion difference, uh, and water has to dissociate um, uh, to form hydrogen ion to maintain electrical neutrality, and we get the classic hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis with large volume saline resuscitation. Increased lactate or keto acids, such as occurs with diabetic ketoacidosis, can also increase the negative side of this equation and make the strong ion difference less. Gap number four was that a child functioning at a high cognitive level is likely to have increased preoperative anxiety. When we see children preoperatively, it is good to know what things are associated with increased risk of anxiety in these kids. Now anxiety is, is quite prevalent. Uh, it's been estimated approximately 60 percent of children have anxiety prior to surgery and it's associated with age greater than seven, shy introverted uh, children, when the parents are very anxious, when the kids are the only kids at home without siblings, they've had prior upsetting hospital experiences, difficult situations, pain, anxiety previously, and they come back in for a similar procedure and they may have more anxiety. And then the last one being the high cognitive ability. It's like they can figure out what's going on and they're anxious about it. Children with a high level of preoperative anxiety are more likely to have some bad things such as emergence delirium, which we have associated with sebofluorine, for example, in kids. Um, they can have behavioral changes postoperatively and problems sleeping and uh, nightmares and even require 
uh, more pain medications because they have more post-operative pain. So we want to stop this uh, preoperative anxiety and therefore oral midazolam is one of the classically administered medications when we believe that anxiety is high in kids. Gap number five was uh, related to substance use disorder and the gap was that of residents with a substance use disorder who continue in their training during residency at least 40 percent will eventually relapse. There was a paper by uh, Dr. Warner in uh, JAMA 2013 where most of this data comes from that uh, shows that substance use disorder during residency is approximately 0.86 percent in this study that IV opioids are the ones that are abused frequently followed by alcohol and then others like propofol that uh, a fair number die during training and that if anesthesiology residents are allowed to come back to training after having a substance use issue um, that if they continue on practicing anesthesia approximately 40% of them will relapse again within the next 30 years and so death and relapse are high if someone comes back into training in anesthesia after having an issue with substances. The sixth gap in 2015 was resuscitation of the unresponsive drowning victim begins with rescue breaths. And this was basically, do you know the difference between the current recommendations for bystander CPR and uh, uh, bystander uh, drowning victim resuscitation? Any person who's unresponsive and not breathing, you start cardiopulmonary resuscitation. The current bystander CPR guidelines focus on beginning with chest compressions. There's less emphasis on, on uh, breathing for the patient, uh, for the person that's arrested that is, and concentrating on adequacy of chest compressions. But the American Heart Association advises two rescue breaths first and then cycles of compressions and breaths when near drowning is the cause. Interestingly, Drowning in different bodies of water causes different problems. If it's in salt water and the salt water gets in the lung, osmosis will pull water from the bloodstream into the lung and the lung fills up uh, uh, with water and the interstitium of the lung fills with water. If you uh, drown in fresh water, uh, <clears throat> near drown that is, the fresh water comes in to the, uh, to the lung and it is hypoosmotic and can cause dilution uh, go into the bloodstream and dilute the red blood cells, cause hemolysis of the red blood cells, change the electrolytes like as potassium concentration which can be changed. So the major gap point of this was when you're resuscitating an unresponsive uh, drowning victim begin with rescue breaths and then continue with your compression rescue breath cycles. The next gap in knowledge was related to metabolic pathways for benzodiazepines. And the gap in knowledge was that lorazepam or Ativan undergoes glucuronidation or a phase two type of metabolism in the liver. And we need to compare lorazepam with midazolam. Midazolam or Versed undergoes phase one metabolism and then followed by glucuronidation or adding a sugar molecule to it. Glucuronidation, or adding a sugar to a drug like lorazepam, creates inactive metabolites. And glucuronidation is rarely susceptible to drug-drug interactions that can affect the cytochrome P450 system, which can be in inhibited by drugs like uh, cimetidine, erythromycin, antifungal agents, protease inhibitors used for HIV treatment. And it can be induced or ramped up to metabolize uh, uh, drugs, uh, drug metabolism with things like barbiturates, rifampin, and carbamazepine or tegretol. So the P450 system is very susceptible to other drugs, be it inhibitors or inducers, while glucuronidation is rarely susceptible to this. So lorazepam, its difference in metabolism from uh, uh, diazepam and a midazolam is the fact that it's conversion to inactive metabolites via glucuronidation. You would expect a patient who is on, for example, protease inhibitors, who you're thinking about giving midazolam to in the preoperative period, that they may have 
inhibition of the metabolism of the, of the midazolam and may have a greater effect from the small doses that we give. Gap number eight was cardiac drug eluting stents and the fact that recent placement of cardiac drug eluting stents is a contraindication to surgery in a freestanding outpatient surgery center. In fact, the current recommendation really is that surgery should not be performed in a surgery center if a patient had insertion of a bare metal stent during the preceding four to six weeks or a drug eluting stent within the last 12 months. <clears throat> There's a high incidence uh, and risk of thrombosis of these stents. If you uh, undergo surgery during this time, the high stress environment and catecholamines and thrombotic state that occurs during surgery, uh, these stents can uh, thrombose off. Within these time frames, surgery, uh, if it needs to be performed, should be performed uh, only if it's urgent and in a place that has full cardiology support such that if the patient had perioperative uh, thrombosis of the stent, they can immediately go to some type of intervention to reopen that stent. Gap number nine in 2015 was lipogenesis is associated with a higher respiratory quotient than gluconeogenesis. Now, respiratory quotient refers to the volume of CO2 that is produced per minute over the volume of oxygen consumed per minute when we're talking about metabolism usually or oxidation of fat as our caloric intake or protein or uh, sugars. And we normally think of sugars as having a respiratory quotient of one, CO2 produced uh, is equal to the amount of oxygen consumed, while fat is 0.7, and protein is approximately 0.8 and our normal diet average is approximately 0.8. If the respiratory quotient is greater than one, um, then this indicates net lipogenesis or formation of fat. And when a patient is in the intensive care unit, for example, being fed via total parental nutrition, if overfeeding is occurring, for example, lots of lipids and intralipids being given and high calor calories, the respiratory quotient if, uh, is greater than one. This is a common reason for failed weaning from mechanical ventilation. You're producing lots of carbon dioxide, which has to be uh, gotten rid of, and also is a risk for fatty liver. So the importance of this respiratory quotient and lipogenesis being associated with respiratory quotient greater than one is that it can be used as an indicator of overfeeding in the ICU and help us wean patients better and avoid a fatty liver in uh, these ICU patients. The next gap was that prazosin is a selective alpha receptor antagonist. Up at the top right shows um, the, the alpha receptor and normally we think of agonism at the alpha-1 receptor as being smooth muscle contraction, uh, usually of blood vessels. Alpha blockers include Cardura, Minipress, Flomax, and they're used for treatment of things like hypertension because they're vasodilators, uh, BPH, benign prosthetic hypertrophy, and preparing patients with pheochromocytoma preoperatively for surgery. When it refers to selectiveness, Selective is, is it uh, for alpha-1, uh, alpha-2, or both? Selective usually is referring to um, uh, whether it is just one of those receptors or both of those receptors. And in the case of non-selective, in the graph on the far right, you can see that uh, we have both reversible and irreversible alpha receptor antagonists. And these are the drugs that are occasionally used to treat patients with pheochromocytoma prior to surgery. Phenoxybenzamine is irreversible. Phentolamine and telazoline are reversible alpha blockers, and they're non-selective. The selective alpha-1s are the most common, the drugs like prazosin and terazosin and the other ones listed here. The 11th gap was that an infant with a tracheoesophageal fistula and esophageal atresia may also have coarctation of the aorta. The important point to realize is that cardiovascular anomalies are highly associated with esophageal atresia. The vactoral 
abbreviations for the V standing for vertebral anomalies, uh, the A standing for anal, anal atresia, C for cardiovascular anomalies, T for tracheoesophageal fistula, E for esophageal atresia, R for uh, renal or radial abnormalities, and L for limb anomalies. So TE fistula, esophageal atresia, uh, cardiovascular anomalies, including coarctation of the aorta. Number 12 gap was that the ASA guidelines recommend that a backup power source be available during delivery of an office-based anesthetic. Office-based anesthesia, ASA and uh, JCO guidelines include that you have to have appropriately trained and credentialed anesthesia personnel, and properly maintained anesthesia equipment, um, uh, standard ASA monitoring, uh, recovery room that's staffed by trained nursing personnel, availability of emergency equipment, um, and a plan for emergency transport of the patient to a comprehensive care center if some complication occurs. Also, an anesthesiologist needs to be physically present until discharge from anesthesia care. This does not mean uh, necessarily from the recovery room, but persons ACLS trained must be present until the patient is discharged home. And if you're using triggering agents, volatile anesthetics and succinylcholine within that center, then you must have MH treatment available, including a dantrolene. The last gap in 2015 was the mechanism of hypercapnia when you give oxygen to a patient with bad COPD. So the uh, gap was that hypercapnia following administration of oxygen to a patient with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is primarily due to ventilation, perfusion, mismatching. Many were taught in medical school, especially years ago, that giving oxygen to a patient with COPD was bad because it would mess with the hypoxic drive and their CO2 would go up even higher. It is true that uncontrolled oxygen administration, high flow oxygen to patients with acute exacerbation of COPD can cause an increase in CO2 in that patient's blood, but it's not due to the hypoxic drive mechanism that was previously discussed uh, uh, in physiology years ago. The mechanism is primarily one of VQ mismatch. When you give oxygen therapy, it counteracts the normal hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction that is present and can open up uh, lungs uh, and blood flow around lung alveoli uh, that should not be opened up, for example, and uh, cause um, uh, blood to go places that you would not want it to go to otherwise. And so oxygen therapy can counteract HPV, alternate ventilation perfusion ratios, and it's the major reason for the oxygen-induced hypercapnia that can occur, VQ, VQ mismatch. But there's also another mechanism, and that is the Haldane effect. Deoxygenated hemoglobin, blood that's going out to our tissues and has had the oxygen removed, when it comes back to the lung, it has a greater tendency to bind carbon dioxide, and that's great. That's what we want it to, to uh, to bind the carbon dioxide there. Um, much higher than oxygenated hemoglobin does. So when you give oxygen to a patient, it increases the oxyhemoglobin and causes a release of more carbon dioxide from the hemoglobin. So the main mechanism for hypercapnia when you give uncontrolled oxygen to a patient with COPD is VQ mismatch with a secondary Haldane effect and not because the hypoxic drive mechanism is altered. If you'd like, listen to and view Gaps in Knowledge 2016 and 2014, which are on separate podcasts, but this finishes Gaps in Knowledge for 2015, and I hope you have a wonderful day.